you're all tired here about this book, for heaven's sake now, right? I mean, how many whiny articles is this guy going to write about this, this stinking thing? <laughs> but the one on the Mises site the other day, you can blame Jeff Tucker for that, just because he's such a good friend, he wants to help me and support me, and he said, we should, we should write a Mises version of the article. Well, just say a few things about the, this book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. Uh, as I mentioned in the preface, this was an idea that Regnery had. They had the idea for the, the, the concept and the title. So the title is not mine. The idea is that they want to do a whole series of these, a series of politically incorrect guides. So it would be an answer to the complete idiot's guide to whatever. Uh, and plus, there is uh, a left-wing series out there. and It's called Introducing Blank, like Introducing whatever, Islam, Capitalism, whatever. <coughs> And you look through it, and it's just complete, just left-wing propaganda. No one seems to be upset about that. You know, that's, that's, a, that's, not, that's okay. But this, because I'm highlighting particular episodes, and I'm giving sort of a free market angle on them, well, this is just completely out, out, out of the question. So when they find out there's going to be a whole series of these, I mean, people are just, some people are going to have to be hospitalized over this. <laughs> oh my gosh, another one! I haven't, I haven't recovered from the first one. Anyway, I'd like to say hello, by the way, to all the people who've been stalking me since the book has come out. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, now, a couple complaints about it I completely share. I mean, there, there are some things in here I'm not entirely happy with and uh, um, I issues that were sort of finessed a little bit. But the thing that frustrates me the most, really, there are two things. Number one is there are no footnotes in the book. And a lot of people have used this as grounds to say, well, you know, how can we take it seriously? Well, two things. Number one, Regnery said no footnotes. Okay, that's it. No footnotes. Now, as you can see from my other books, I'm footnote crazy. I mean, footnotes everywhere. You know, George Washington was the first president. Superscript one. Okay. So, 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 so it's not like some kind of secret plot of mine, you know, to, to put to fake stuff in here and not footnote it. They, the idea of the book is that it's supposed to be fun and accessible, like the Complete Idiots guys, which don't have footnotes. So the purpose of it is, you know, I introduce people to new material, I have a long bibliography, I'm citing people as I go along, which is good enough. And, and I've answered, when people have emailed me to say, well, how do I find more about this, or where'd you get that? You know, typically I've been replying to that um, as, as time permits. So that's an unfortunate aspect, but that's the way this type of book is written. They don't want it to be weighed down by a heavy, heavy scholarly apparatus. The second thing is there was a word limit that was strictly imposed. They said this cannot exceed 80,000 words. Now, I've gotten a lot of complaints about it from people on the left saying it's not, you know, victimological enough, it's not focusing on this or that group. And, you know, again, with 80,000 words, and look, it's my book. I want to focus on things that interest me. So I'm interested in the Constitution. I'm interested in uh, World War I. I'm interested in things of that kind. So that's what I'm going to write about in my 80,000 words. 80,000 words go, go by so fast trying to cover the you know, history of the U.S. It's unbelievable. What I originally submitted to Regnery was 100,000 words, secretly hoping they just wouldn't count. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, they've got a full-time counter over there because uh, it was scaled. But first, they, they told me to scale it back. So I scaled it back a little and then sent it back again. And then they basically, in consultation with me, they scaled it back to 80,000. So I feel like it would have been better as, as a longer book. But on the other hand, the reason they want it short is, again, they're, they're excellent marketers at Regnery. You've got to hand them that. And their view is that it needs to be of a size that people will actually read. It might be intellectually satisfying for me to write 800,000 words, but then it'll just sit there on the shelf and nobody will read it. The idea is that this is not meant to be a history of the United States. It's a guide. It's a highlight to certain episodes of, of interest and importance. Now, the reason that I am pleased with it, even though it's, you know, okay, it's at a sort of popular level, which is fine. It's different from sort of other things I've written. The reason I'm particularly pleased with it, though, is that it introduces to a large audience a lot of our people and their work that they would never have found out about before. Because I, I don't think a lot of people are reading, you know, Armentano on antitrust, but now maybe they might. Okay, they never heard of him because we tend to talk to scholarly communities, that sort of thing. The ordinary person doesn't, doesn't get uh, acquainted with this sort of thing. Or, or scholarly articles that people can look up, that sort of thing. How would they have known about this before? So what I'm trying to do is, as you go through the book, I have in little boxes on the various pages, uh, a little box called A Book You're Not Supposed to Read. That was my idea. A Book You're Not Supposed to Read. And it would be some book that, you know, again, like um, 
I think uh, Bert Folsom's book is one of those books you're not supposed to read. And the idea is to highlight a whole tradition of scholarship that flies totally under the radar, that doesn't, doesn't get on television, you don't hear much about, but to acquaint people and say, Here's, here are things, here's how you can pursue your research on this and your reading on this. Here, here are reliable sources. So that, that I was pleased with. Now, it's true, it, it was on the, the New York Times bestseller list for some time, uh, which was an sh absolute shock to me. I mean, I was very happy, but some of that has to do with, I'm sure, the fact that, again, Regnery has got just an absolute unstoppable machine when it comes to publicity and promotion and marketing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, the first week, when, when, when I had my so-called launch week, which is the, the week that they're really going to start pushing the, the publicity, I mean, I must have gone three days with almost no sleep at all because I, you know, I would... I, I was on Hannity and Combs, then I did Alan Combs' radio show after that. The funny thing is, we got along great. I mean, we got along just great. Like on the commercial breaks, um, I remember saying to him, how do, you, how do you keep your sanity at this network? You know, we all want to ask you this question. You know, how are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I appreciated that. sort of frank with me, you know, with the, the things. And so we got along just great, you know. And, and he said, you know, my, my wife is a Christian. Because I was saying to him, you know, I can't believe there are so many Christians in the country who are just completely... Uh, they just they think that Pentagon press conferences are you know like sacred scripture for heaven's sake, <laughs> and uh, and he said you know my wife's a Christian but you know she you know she at least she walks the walk you know she, he said I don't share her faith but she walks the, so we had a good you know great um, exchange but anyway so then I was supposed to be on Fox and Friends the next morning which I've never watched not because I don't watch the channel or whatever but because when would I ever be up at six in the morning. Like, I've never, never. I mean, I'm an academic. I, I resent having it up at nine in the morning. <laughs> so, so, I, you know, so I went on this program, and I'll tell you, these folks, could, they couldn't have been nicer. They could not have been nicer. And I, I didn't know any of them because I never, I don't know, watched this program, but sure enough, I was, but, you know, it's first thing in the morning, and I was all wired when I got back from the, the late night radio. So I, had, I hadn't slept a wink. It wasn't like I slept an hour. Nothing, no sleep at all. And I thought, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I'm totally... But sure enough, there's like some chemical in my brain that when there's no sleep, it's this magic chemical that comes, comes aboard. I think it may be in effect right now, as a matter of fact. Coming ahead, <laughs> helping me out in the, the lack of sleep. Uh, so I, I can't tell you how exciting this whole thing was because normally I lead this very sort of quiet you know, life and you know, very uneventful. And now all of a sudden, I, you know, I'm going three days where I'm not getting any sleep, or then I'm supposed to be on Ernie Brown's show, and his show's from midnight to one, and then I'm supposed to be on Scarborough Country that week, and I, I can't possibly do this. I actually wrote to the directory and said, please, please cancel something. I'm going to drop dead here. So thank, thank goodness for them. Though. They've got connections with everybody, so it, 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 it's, it's been great. The thing that has sort of disappointed me, um, all right. At this point, I don't even I don't look at Amazon anymore. You know, you have this heady period where you look at Amazon every day and see what your rank is and how it's going. You know, I'll admit that. I mean, Virginia Postrel admitted that that she looks at it like ten times a day or something. Well, I, I don't know if I was supposed to say that or not. Uh, but but but, um, but I stopped because I, I just you know I. I don't. I know that there are some people who I guess I didn't realize this before. There are some people who don't read a book and then they post a review of it. Like they read a bad review and then they say, oh, well, I'm a big crusader for justice. I've got to go and write a review against this book before the country goes completely down the tubes because of it. And so we get, you know, this David Greenberg writes this review the other day. And, and I, so I wondered to myself, because I've only recently have I stopped totally stumbling in Amazon, I wondered, well, gosh, it's funny, there's a whole slew of one-star reviews by people who obviously haven't read it. Like, I mean, just flagrant that they haven't. Uh, I wonder what's causing this. And then it turns out like whole sentences from these reviews are lifted from this, this guy's review. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so Amazon is just, uh, that's just, that's just a shame. But what's disappointed me though is that people on the left, it, it amazes me how much they don't understand libertarians, they don't understand conservatives. It amazes me. Because I used to have at least an abiding respect for some of the people at Foxhounds where they would keep an eye on the Fox News channel and tell us what they're saying. But then the way they treated me, I thought, was unbelievable. They were saying, well, Sean Hannity, this book will be right up Sean Hannity's alley. I said, well, you mean you watch Sean Hannity basically round the clock, and you can't tell the difference between Sean Hannity and me? I mean, what, what is the matter here? Why does the left have such problem making distinctions? You know, why, why can't they at least say, well, you know, this, is, you know, this, isn't, this isn't Rush Limbaugh. It's a kind of a, 
I still don't agree with it, but at least it's an older tradition that you know that doesn't think that you know that that isn't maniacally focused on war. That's focused on decentralization of power, as you know, some older lefties used to favor that. I mean, you'd think they would see some distinctions here. None, none. This is just a Sean Hannity. I mean, come on, you know, it's just very frustrating. So anyway, that's that. So I, I'm, I, I think that by now we're we're looking at with a there's a paperback edition, which is the main. These are all going to be paperback books. That's the main uh, issue. But then there's also a special hardcover edition that was printed mainly for select book clubs. So when you can put those together, I think we're in the vicinity of about 50,000 sold at this point. So it's been, been about, um, I think, three months since the, the publicity started, and I think three and a half since the uh, book came out. So, you know, quite quite pleased with how it's gone. Now, weirdly enough, I have a second book here that uh, I'm uh, publishing. Now, this one, you might think that maybe I just got cold feet after I had Longstreet on the cover. Now I now I have a cover like this. <laughs> but this is this isn't doing wonders for me at all. So let's try. No, actually, the, the the thing is that this other book is called The Church and the Market. Uh, it actually this is a this is a book that it's published by Lexington, which is a division of Roman and Littlefield, and and, and actually they they publish hardcover and paperback simultaneously. But the paperbacks are all sold out at the moment, and. And f for a split second, I thought, wow, sales must be great. But then, of course, I'm forgetting it's a scholarly press. The print run is probably 50. Of course, they're out of it. <laughs> so to get books in here in time for the, the conference, they, they sent the hardcover. Now, the hardcover, I'll tell you what this book is uh, uh, all about in a minute, but the hardcover typically retails, I kid you not, $75. You can get it for 20 at this event, okay? Because they said to make up for the fact they were out of the paper, they'll give us this at the hardcover price. You, what they do, like, why would they sell the hardcover for seventy-five? Basically, to to um, take advantage of institutions that have to purchase them, like libraries or whatever. That'll be seventy-five dollars. Thank you very much. So they don't expect many individuals to buy them. But now here's your today's your lucky day, because the it, that's basically the same price. That they're selling it for twenty. It's the same price as the paper. Well, this book actually came right out of an Austrian scholars conference of a few years ago, where I gave a paper on Catholic social teaching. Because now that I've basically alienated everybody on the left, now I'm going to go after all my traditional allies, so that it'll be pretty much uh, me and Tom DiLorenzo. A few other people will be my friends still. Let's see anybody else who can be alienated by me. Well, I, I wrote it because you know I'm associated. I have certain. I'm I'm in all different circles. I'm in so many different circles. It's unbelievable. Uh, and occasionally I see at a conference like this one guy from like the Latin Mass magazine conference I was at it's on Sunday, and it's like worlds are colliding. You're not supposed to be at this conference. Well, you know, I think of myself. You know, I'm 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 um, you know sort of an amateur Austrian. I mean, I've been studying the the Austrians pretty intensely for about 12 years now, ever since I went to the, the Mises University, which is one of the greatest experiences I, I'd ever had academically. And when I was in college. I had the benefit of a great university library. I was at Harvard, and they had everything, and they had every journal. It was unbelievable. I don't think I, I think I had to use interlibrary loan maybe three, four times my whole college career. It was unbelievable the resources. So when the institute sent me this bibliography saying here are some sources that well they sent a few things like you know what has government done to our money, but then they sent a bibliography saying here are some additional articles and resources you might look at. I read all of them. I mean, talk about a geek. I spent the whole summer. Going through the library and just looking through all these articles. So I remember, I, I remember uh, Tom DiLorenzo won't remember this, but I remember seeing, meeting him for the first time out in California and saying, "Oh yeah, I've read your antitrust material." I mean, what a geek, right? A little suck up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love this stuff. I mean, I, I found it so compelling. I just absolutely fell in love with it. And then in my life, I went through a brief little phase where I sort of became one of these anti-market conservative types. You're like, ah, you know, just sort of angry and. And uh, you know the market leads to bad things, and, but then finally I just thought you know the more uh, the more I talked to people in that tradition, the, the less I found they knew what they were talking about. The less I found they knew about economics, and I think what really absolutely solidified me and put me completely back, totally 100% in the pro Mises camp was actually Hans Hoppe's book on democracy, which was exactly sort of at the point I was at at that point that he was making arguments that sort of appealed to my my brain. So now I'm totally here. The problem is that. Among traditional Catholics, the, the sense is that capitalism is another one of these bad modern ideologies. And my own view is that capitalism, in a certain sense, is not really an ism. 
It's not an ism. It's just saying, don't steal things. Okay, just don't, just stop it. If you're tempted to do it, don't. Okay? I mean, okay, that's maybe just a little bit of an, you know, uh, oversimplification, but that's the way I look at it. And I'm so compelled by the Austrian uh, tradition. So I wrote this book trying to show, uh, in effect, trying to justify myself and, and, and the position of other people who have this vague sense that they're being somehow disloyal if they, to the church if they like uh, Austrian economics. So I've tried to show, uh, to the contrary, that uh, there has been such a diversity of opinion on economic matters over the centuries within the church that certainly there is room for legitimate, uh, licit disagreement on these matters. And so I've got a chapter, I've got an introduction, I've got a chapter called In Defense of Economics, because there are some people, I think, who think that economics is just a sham science that's developed as a rationalization for greed, and I'm trying to show that's not the case. I'm trying to show the unique virtues of the Austrian school, in particular, why they, that should be appealing. And everything, I mean, major issues you can imagine, wages, prices, labor unions, money and banking, uh, there's a chapter on foreign aid and the economics of foreign aid and the morality of foreign aid because there was a whole encyclical letter in 1967 basically saying we've got to support foreign aid programs. Well, they've, they've been a disaster. So what now is the, what is the moral status of that demand? So I'm trying to, again, carve out a space, again, for, for illicit uh, disagreement on non-essential <laughs> matters. There's a welfare state chapter. So this, in case you're thinking Michael Novak has already done all this, Michael Novak looks like a girly boy next to this book. Okay. <laughs> totally, you know, totally consistent. And then finally, there's the last chapter is on distributism, which is this view among some traditionalists that, you know, instead of uh, instead of the the division of labor, wi wide scale division of labor, we should instead have a situation in which most people are landowners, property owners, uh, largely if not entirely uh, self sufficient. That type of thing is sometimes presented as if it's the only licit Catholic system, which uh, I hope not, because most people would be dead under that system. So I, I've written the, the longest chapter is a critique of that. Now, if, if any of you know of any long critiques of distributism, let me know, because I wanted to find some so I could use some of those ideas, and I couldn't find any long uh, critique of it. So I had to, it's all my own. So it has all the weaknesses of the fact that it's entirely original to me. Uh, but I, I did the best I could with it. So, so here you go. You got uh, these two things. Um, but please, since I'm not going to have any friends left after them, stay my friends, folks, okay? <laughs> All right, thank, thank you so much.